how we deal with biodiversity on this planet, climate change is only going to become more of an issue for us and, and probably a more severe issue than we're already dealing with. Uh, certainly, climate change is already a problem for us human beings. Um, I think Louis told me that predominantly the audience here is based in North America and, and South America. And uh, I don't think anybody needs to tell any of you that we're seeing more extreme weather events in those areas. Uh, we're seeing the loss of high altitude snow cover and glaciers. We're seeing more evidence of flooding on both continents. And certainly there's sea level changes on both continents as well. If you have the, the misfortune to live on some of the Caribbean islands, you're experiencing it much more severely than the majority of us are experiencing it. Um, the thing about climate change and biodiversity is the idea is generally that climate ch change is shifting environmental parameters such that they are drivers behind biodiversity loss. So the idea there is that climate change is actually having a direct effect on whether species can be where they are or do what they should be doing in the area that they already exist in. And there are certainly some cases that are reasonably well documented about fairly direct, or at least not so indirect, but still indirect impacts on species and species collections as climate's changing. The Great Barrier Reef's a really good example of how climate change is associated with bleaching and is, is leading to a catastrophic loss of life on the reef. And those of you in North America hear consistently about the problems with climate change and polar bears. But some people have been actually looking through a lot of the publications on climate change and its impacts on, on biodiversity. And in fact, when you dig into a lot of the studies, the idea that climate change is going to have an effect on, on, on biodiversity is based on assumptions of the biological effects of climate change. So generally, the assumption is when the habitat has changed enough, uh, the, the species that live there either must disperse to an area where they can't, where, where they have a better habitat set up, they adapt to the changes that are happening in their environment, or they go extinct. And the, the process through which they go extinct have various physiological impacts, effects on breeding cycles, effects on recruitment into populations, uh, species interactions like prey availability, but when uh, this, this paper by Urban et al. published in 2016 in Science showed that actually 23% of the studies they reviewed actually included a biological mechanism that showed how species should go into decline or enter into extinction due to climate change. That's actually quite important. Um, we, we can stand back and say that climate change is going to screw up a lot of biodiversity on this planet. But if we're actually going to mitigate the impacts of climate change, we really need to know the biological mechanisms that are causing species to go into decline through climate change. So for example, if, if we assume that climate change is having a, a, an impact on a species because they're not able to breed properly, but in fact, the effect is on the physiology of the animal such that they can't capture prey, if our mitigation efforts are there to actually increase recruitment by helping breeding, that's not gonna have an impact on species stability because they still won't be able to catch their prey. So we need to know these biological mechanisms if we're gonna affect conservation in the face of climate change. Now, all of you being involved in the amphibian arc are, are familiar with the concept of global amphibian declines. And I imagine most of you have read the Houlihan paper from 2000 in Nature, which was sort of the actual taking the siren call that came out of the first World Congress of Herpetology and putting numbers on it in terms of what the impacts are. And I think it, it's worth revisiting the figures from this paper and some of the outcomes of this paper, just to remind ourselves of what the impacts are on populations. And, and, and Jeff Houlihan and his colleagues neatly split the studies into North America and Western Europe, where, where essentially people were doing a lot more population monitoring than any other part of the world. And in those diagrams, you can see the white spots are the number of studies that actually were included to generate these cumulative annual trend data that are the black spots in these declining lines in both panels. And, and the thing to recall from, for these black spots is they're not actually changes in population size. What they are is changes in the rate at which populations are changing. So the idea there would be if you were at a, a value of zero, 
population change is, is neutral. Nothing's increasing, nothing's decreasing. But as those black dots go further and further away from zero, it's the rate of population change that's increasing, not the actual number. So in other words, both these plots are describing a situation where the rate of population decline is accelerating over time. And I, I don't know if there are data available for extending these lines, but in both cases on these boxes, they've managed to sort of, sort of plateau out at a minus one value, which is an enormous rate of population decline and seems to be consistent across a lot of populations. Furthermore, a paper just came out this year in current biology uh, that reevaluated the, uh, the, the global amphibian assessment, um, basically including a lot more information from species that were considered data deficient at the time. And the inclusion of these species in a reassessment of, of amphibians that had been assessed beforehand suggests that actually we're not at a 40% of amphibian species at risk, but literally half of all amphibian species are at risk. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar about what those drivers are in terms of, of risk to species and that habitat loss remains the number one predictor of whether a species is going to be at risk. But certainly climate change is shooting up uh, in, in terms of drivers of, of putting species at risk and, and that's not surprising. But again, as I said in the previous slide, we need to know the biological mechanisms behind this. And when you actually look at a lot of the sort of broad brush climate change papers for amphibians, what they're really doing is relating climate change to species ranges. And there's a lot of assumptions about a species range, as you all know, that may not actually translate into the results that they see in these papers if you don't understand the biological mechanisms through which uh, climate change may be affecting species. But certainly we've been looking at climate change for about 30 or 40 years as a driver of amphibian loss. And, and, and again, it is invoking these incompatibilities between amphibians and warming and drying. So the idea is that habitat loss would involve things like ponds drying, um, habitats that amphibians live in are moving outside thermal envelopes that are suitable for amphibians to, to live and breed. Um, and that rainfall or other estimates of humidity are, are changing in a manner that just makes things too dry even in the terrestrial environment for amphibians. But even at that point, when we were looking at climate change being implicated in amphibian decline, other authors were coming up with, with, with other factors that seemed to be working in concert with climate change. And predominantly, those factors that people were looking at were pollutants and infectious disease as cofactors associated with climate change. But we are lucky. There are some really good examples showing uh, direct mechanistic impacts of climate change on amphibians. And Chris Redding published a paper in 2007 in, in the journal Ecologia. And I think this is one of the, 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 the absolute best examples of showing how climate change can have a, a, a direct effect on amphibian species. In this case, it's the common frog, Rana temporaria. And, and I really want to iterate, reiterate here that the reason why Chris was able to come up with these data is, is exemplified in this graph right here. That's 20 plus years of field surveys at a pond. It's these long-term monitoring projects that are really allowing us to make some sort of inference or even show directly what the biological mechanism is through which climate change is impacting amphibians. So these are the temperature data at the site and whether you're looking at minimum temperature, maximum temperature, or average for the year, all these estimates are showing a, a significant increase in temperature over the course of the study and it's quite interesting to note that the temperature changes that are being recorded at those studies are on par with sort of global estimates at the rate at which temperature is changing in our planet. And they're probably covering a temperature range that we consider to be sort of the gold standard for things going too far in the planet. In other words, about a two degree temperature change. It's also really nice to see in a study like this where all metrics of temperature are being compared. I'm sure you read climate change papers where you see a specific measure of temperature being used to show that there's an impact on a species or an impact on abundance. And I think we, we run the risk of sort of selecting the specific temperature and environmental metric that makes the case for us the best. And what Chris has done here is he said, I'm not gonna focus in on one temperature metric. I'm going to take three and show that the patterns are relatively consistent. Along the course of the study, what he did while the temperature was changing 
He went out to the sites, caught frogs migrating into the ponds. He individually marked them so that he could get year-on-year -year survival estimates. And he weighed and measured them and used the snout ischium length and the mass to generate a body condition index for animals. And uh, the first thing I'll show from this other than the temperature changes are these body condition index values for the animals. And it's pretty clear here, you can see that uh, frog condition was deteriorating over the course of the study and deteriorating in a way that was consistent with increasing temperature. So he hypothesized that this was happening because the change in temperature was truncating the amount of time that was available for amphibians to overwinter. So in other words, winters were shorter, winters were warmer, and as a result, animals were going in and not hibernating for as long a period. Or if they were hibernating, they physiologically weren't slowed down as much as they would be if they were given a nice cold winter. As a result, the animals either weren't acquiring the resources before they went into hibernation, or they were coming out too early uh, before going to the pond and food wasn't available to them, or while they were in hibernation, they were using what fat bodies they had stored up and they were coming out scrawnier and scrawnier year after year. And the last diagram I'll show from that is this relationship between body condition and for females, survival. And I think this is pretty cool because he shows, again, there's that body condition value, the dark dots there, but he shows that essentially the probability of female survival year on year decreases at a rate that's really similar to the decrease in body condition. So in other, this, he didn't show this for males, but I mean, we're all aware of the fact with amphibians that females invest a lot more in reproduction than males do, at least in terms of mass and resources. So it, it makes a lot of sense that as body condition goes down, females are probably gonna decrease their ability to reproduce. But what Chris is showing here, that decrease in body condition isn't necessarily affecting their ability to breed, but it's actually saying if they're going out there and trying to be breeding females, it's probably costing them their lives much more frequently than earlier on when they were getting good overwintering. I mean, when you look at that female survival rate value on the right-hand side, we're going from a situation where over 50% of the females were surviving year on year to a situation where about 10% of the females were surviving year on year. I think overall, when you put that story together, that's some of the best evidence that we have that climate change can have a direct effect on an amphibian population and do that by having an effect on amphibians' ability to maintain body condition and have the body condition that allows them to have a higher probability of survival year on year. Okay, uh, carrying on, I'm gonna switch into infectious disease now because I told you that uh, my heart's kind of, kind of in that. And it also, I, I would say it's, it's probably the other threatening process that's out there that we really don't know what we're gonna do about it. Just like climate change, we're kind of in this situation where we say climate change and infectious diseases are problems, and we keep banging on and on that they're problems, but what we lack right now are strategies to stop changing climate, or at least mitigate the impacts of climate change on biodiversity. And we're in the exact same boat in terms of infectious disease. We've got lots of strategies in place for other threatening processes. So, you know, we do, we do pretty good jobs in certain parts of the world removing invasive species. We're getting pretty good at doing things like rewilding and reclaiming habitat that's been lost due to human activities. And, and our abilities, and, and we've actually done a pretty good job stopping putting some pollutants into the environment. And we've shown, you know, outside of things like that, that these, these persistent pollutants, we've done a pretty good job at actually decreasing pollutants in the environment when we stop dumping them out there. But it's different with climate change because we're not slowing down in terms of releasing the things that are causing climate change. And similarly with infectious disease, once it's out there, we don't really know how to put the genie back in the bottle. And like climate change, infectious disease is affecting biodiversity, not just simply a handful of species. And these pictures that I've got here are just examples of some of the organisms that are in decline, and in some cases uh, driven extinct due to infectious diseases. So everything from marine algae to mammals, flowering plants, invertebrates, both aquatic and terrestrial, 
food plants that we're interested in, and of course amphibians, are in decline due to infectious diseases. And it's, it's, it's strange that infectious disease should do that because the stupidest thing a parasite can, can do is cause the host to decline. Parasites need their hosts to complete their life cycles. So the loss of the host should result in loss of the parasite. So it's certainly maladaptive to cause host decline. Despite that fact, we're seeing more cases of infectious disease emergence causing mass mortality, population declines, and in some cases, post extinction. Like climate change though, we're in a position right now with a lot of these situations with infectious diseases that we can point the finger clearly to what we're doing as human beings that are causing these infectious diseases to get worse. And certainly that's the case for amphibians. And I'm sure most everybody that's listening right now has heard of chytrid fungi. Uh, I'm gonna focus in this talk predominantly on the, the first one that was discovered, the Trachochytrium dendrobotitis. And this is an example here, the photograph here on the top is an example of a, of a day in the life of working on uh, the common midwife toad up in the French Pyrenees, walking around the edge of a pond and collecting the 24 hour mortalities of recently metamorphosed common midwives that have died due to chytridiomycosis. Um, below, though, probably an infectious disease you are familiar with, but not to the degree that you know about chytrid fungi, are the ranaviruses. And the photograph that I have here is an example of a UK common frog that's experiencing severe ranavirosis, and in this case, the cutaneous ulcerative form of the disease. Essentially, they get superficial skin lesions, big bloody sores on the body, limb axes, sometimes their eyes bleed, sometimes they vomit blood. And in the other form of the, the other form of the disease, they get systemic hemorrhages where their internal organs bleed out. If you go through the literature on parasitism and infectious disease in amphibians, these two groups consistently drop out as the factors behind mass mortality events in amphibians. Certainly, there's a lot of data out there saying that Betrachochytrium dendrobotitis is responsible for amphibian population declines and, in some cases, species extinctions. And we're now actually in the reality that ranaviruses are starting to do the same things to amphibian species, and even worse, doing it to reptilian species as well. So here's some examples of, of what's happened when Betrachochytrium dendrobotitis broke out and did bad things to amphibians. On the top are data from a couple of papers by Karen Lips and her colleagues. And on the left-hand panel, you can see the wave of amphibian extinction that went down the Isthmus of Panama that pretty much everybody that's listening to this right now is very familiar with being from the Americas. The right panel is from her PLOS biology, pardon me, her PNAS paper, when they were in forgot the name of it, they were in Panama, I can't remember the name of the site, um, but where they were out doing amphibian monitoring, um, doing it for fun reasons rather than disease reasons. And what they plotted here are basically the diurnal and nocturnal counts of amphibians they encountered. Up till 2004, sometime in say September, when they encountered the first animal that appeared to be dying from chytridiomycosis. And in a matter of months, they tracked, I think it was something like a 60% loss of amphibian biomass in part, it's El Cope, sorry, the El Cope region, 60% reduction in amphibian biomass. Now I've, I've given, I've used this slide for talks uh, at, at parasite and infectious disease meetings involving human infectious diseases, livestock infectious diseases, uh, wildlife infectious diseases. I've given this talk at places like Oxford and Cambridge, presented these slides in places like Oxford, and Cambridge and Liverpool, where there are really significant centers of infectious disease study. And I've challenged the audience to come up with another example of a parasite that has affected so many species simultaneously in such a short period of time. And nobody has ever been able to come up with another example of an infectious disease having such a severe effect on biodiversity in such a short period of time. So it's truly amazing what BD has done to amphibians. The panel below comes from Vance Fredenberg's work with Sherry Briggs and Roland Knapp, where they showed BD breaking out in the Mountain Yellow Lake Frog in the Sierra Nevadas in California. And those panels, you can see green populations on the far left. Those are frogs present and BD absent. 
and in the next few years, an explosion of BD across this one matrix of bonds, and the, the, the recruitment of black sites, which are essentially sites where frogs have been eradicated due to chytridium mycosis. So this is, this is pretty crazy stuff in terms of infectious disease and its consequences for hosts. Um, ranaviruses are, on the other hand, are, are, are known for being rather ubiquitous parasites of fish, reptiles, and amphibians. And they've been known to cause amphibian mortalities in Asia, Australia, well, Australasia as, as an arc, actually, the Americas, and Europe for, for decades. But it's only been in the last, say, 10 or 20 years, we're really starting to accumulate the data that shows ranaviruses can act just like chytridiomycete fungi and drive amphibian populations into decline. So just flipping back to BD, this was a, a paper we published in 2013 in PLOS One, where we sort of accumulated all the data from all the people who were willing to throw their data into the pot and just map the distribution of BD as we knew it at the time. And uh, this, this is a screenshot of the maps that we put into that, um, into that publication. And it's pretty straightforward. Red dots are where we have clear positives at the site. White dots are sites where we felt the sampling was robust enough for us to say there was a lack of infection there because none of them tested positive. And blue sites are the ones where probably sampling wasn't strong enough Despite the fact that we couldn't detect BD, we weren't comfortable saying that's a true negative site. Uh, what you can see is that BD is pretty much everywhere. Everywhere you look for it, you're going to find it. But what's, what's not clear here is the impacts of BD in terms of amphibian mortality. Now, certainly you could focus in on Australia and, and Central America, and there's places where certainly there's good evidence that amphibians have been in decline due to infection because of BD. But look at the distribution that we knew of at that time in Africa. And right now, we still only know of potentially two species in Africa that may have gone into decline due to chytridiomycosis, one the Gansey spray toad, and the other possibly the Lake Oku frog up in, in, in Cameroon. Look at the distribution, the number of red dots that we see in North America, and the number of sites where we think amphibians are in decline due to chytridiomycosis are actually extremely limited in North America. So this begets the question, if this really bad pathogen is all around the world, why are we only seeing declines in mass mortalities in some areas? And this is where we think climate is interacting with infectious disease. So I'm gonna present some data that we've been generating in Europe. Uh, this is the common midwife toad here. That's the male carrying the eggs, um, recently fertilized eggs from the looks of them. And he'll do that until it's time for the eggs to hatch. And then he'll hop to the pond and release the eggs in the site. And these are data for tadpole counts in a place called Peñalara Natural Park, which is just outside Madrid in Spain. And, and these are the dynamics that we saw for tadpoles in this species over a very short period of time. These are data that Jaime Bosch generated. And, and literally, we saw catastrophic decline in tadpoles over a couple of years. And the data are still being generated at these sites. I'll show some of them a little bit further on. There's still no evidence of population recovery in Penulera. And in a paper he published in 2007, Jaime showed that when you look at the climate data for, for um, Penulera, there's probably a climate explanation on why Kitra became severe in that region. So, so what this plot shows on, on, the, on the left axis is the number of days a temperature is met. And then on the bottom axis is the temperature itself. So starting for the far left value, you can see approximately 60 days a year, Penulera is at 10 degrees centigrade. So remember, it's a high elevation site. It's cold. The number of days that it actually gets warm in Penulera are actually few and far between. But what he actually showed at this location is sites before the emergence of disease, represented by the black dots, the number of days that the temperature reached, say, 20, 22, 24, 26 degrees, were actually fewer than in the years just preceding and during the breakout of chytridiomycosis. So in other words, the summer days became more frequent and summers became warmer. And they did so predominantly over the temperature envelope that we know is optimal for the growth of BD when you grow it in the lab. So here, there's a pretty straightforward link, we think, 
between climate change and chytridium mycosis. Penularia got warmer and specifically got warmer in the months and tadpoles are in the ponds and metamorphs come hopping out of the ponds and in so doing brought more of those days into that optimal range when chytrid can grow and reproduce and go out and infect animals and increase the burden of infection in tadpoles and metamorphs. And as a result, we started to see decreases in tadpoles because we had mass mortality events of post metamorphic animals. But Susan Walker led on a paper in 2010 where we looked at uh, common midwife toads across Siberia. And I want you to focus in, if you look at that left map, that's all the sites that she managed to, to sample during the course of her PhD. But I wanna focus in on that top right-hand panel, that's in the Pyrenees, where we've seen um, chytridiomycosis associated mortality since about 2004. And if you look to the panel to the right, those are the populations that we've been sampling for the last 15 years. And what you see in those populations are color, color values. And the idea there is that the redder the color is, the higher the prevalence is in the tadpoles. So in other words, we've got some sites where there's really, really high prevalence of infection and heavy infections in tadpoles. Whereas other sites, things seem to be a little bit more yellow. And we actually have some yellow sites that are pretty close to red sites. So this is quite different from what we saw in Central America when chytrid went rampaging down the Isthmus of Panama and high prevalence emerged and animals died like crazy. What we're actually seeing in, in, in the Pyrenees is we're not seeing chytrid driven to saturation in all the populations where it's broken out or driven to saturation like we saw in Pendulara for that matter. Now the plots below, these show the values for these sites that actually test positive and they're broken down into altitude and temperature values. And the temperature value in this case is the average coldest temperature per month. So again, we're in a pretty cold place because you can see the average coldest temperature is ranging from something like two degrees to 12 degrees centigrade. So we'll start with the altitude panel on the left. Uh, one stands for sites where we see mortality. So these are the values on the x-axis. One are sites where we see mortality and two are sites where we see infection but we don't see post-metamorphic mortality. So you can see in altitude or in, in, in the altitude values, the sites where we see mortality actually only are at a very narrow altitudinal range. Now flip over to the temperature side of the graph and those same sites where we see mortality, they happen to be the coldest sites in the area or some of the coldest sites in the area. So there seems to be this relationship between particularly high altitude and particularly cold temperatures that are associated with mortality in Penulera. That's quite different, or pardon, in the Pyrenees. That's quite different from Penulera, where mortality was associated with warming. Now you can see I've got a statement on the other side, however, no loss of populations. And indeed, we've not seen common midwives go extinct in the Pyrenees. So although there seems to be particular altitude temperature envelopes that are associated with mortality, that envelope doesn't seem to be driving populations to extinction like they have in Penulera. And some of our most recent data suggest at least two of the sites where we saw declines due to chytridiomycosis, common midwives are bouncing back. So we've got these two climate envelopes that can cause mortality. One seems to lead to extirpation, the warming. Cold seems to cause mortality, but it doesn't seem to drive extirpation. But in both cases, it's climate, climate variation that's behind these disease dynamics. Now we're actually seeing, to move beyond just focusing in on common midwives, we've actually been sampling, at least at one location, other species that are present in the pond. So these graphs here are showing common midwives, a common toads, and ranotemporary, the common frog. Ranotemporary is in red, common toads are in green, and the blues are two values for elites. And this is across seven years or eight years of studying the species. What you can see is pretty much elites tadpoles are ubiquitously infected. They've all got a they've all got infections. But what you can see is that in common toads and in common frogs, prevalence shot up in 2010 and 2011, and then declined again in 2012 onto 2014. Now, when you look at how climate changed in that area, these are plots for the, um, they're pretty squiggly plots, but I just want you to focus on after July and before July. So there's a line for each year here. And what you can see is after July, 
although they're quite squiggly, those lines are starting to overlap quite significantly. So basically summer through to winter, we're seeing pretty similar um, uh, climate or wet temperature variation at the sites that don't really give us much information on why sites might be different in terms of spillover into these other hosts. But before July and going back to May, you can see there's a lot more diversification in those lines. There's a lot more spread. And that spread is about when does spring actually start in those sites. So for some of those lines, you can see, for instance, in, I think it's 2013 is the far right one. In that spring, it was quite delayed before temperature increased. So in other words, it was a cold winter and it stayed a cold winter. On the far left, you can see a squiggly line for 2011 is the most left. And in that case, temperature started shooting up in May. So in other words, that was a short winter and an early onset of spring. And when you map these spring values against prevalence, so on the bottom, you'll see the start of spring, how many days after winter ended did it take before spring picked up? You can actually see that prevalence for, the, for, for ladies is consistent across that time variation. But for both common toads and common frogs, if the start of spring is, is delayed, there's much fewer infections in those animals. But when the start of spring is, is, is early, as it was in 2011 and 2010, that's when we see prevalence of infection pushed up in those animals. And I'm not just talking about infection in those animals. That actually was when we started seeing mass mortalities of these other two species in these sites as well. So you've got this effect of climate potentially driving mortality in elites at a post-metamorphic time. But other species, common toads and common frogs in this case, were kind of resistant to infection over some of those temperature envelopes. But once we saw temperature changing to the point that spring started very early and winters were really raw, warm, that's when we started seeing the other species affected by infection and mortality. So what about the other pathogen? What about ranoviruses? Well, these are maps showing the distribution of ranovirus in common frogs in the UK. So starting off in 1992, that's when we first started recognizing that there were mass mortalities happening in the UK due to ranoviruses. And when you go all the way to the right to the map on 2010, you can see the distribution of cases associated with ranovirosis have now spread as far north as Scotland and have really intensified in areas like around Manchester, around London, and around the south coast of England. So what we've seen was essentially localized cases of ranovirosis in common frogs early on when the, when the pathogen was introduced into the UK. And now we've seen an increased distribution of ranovirus across the island. And as a result, we're seeing more and more cases of ranovirus associated mortality in common frogs. This is actually what happens to common frog populations about 50% of the time when ranovirus emerges. So ranovirus, when it emerges in common frog populations, it can be a blip, you just pop up and have one really bad year, and then we don't see infection in those populations again. In some cases, we see populations that have really bad emergences, and then we don't see common frogs there again. We can't really call those extinctions due to ranovirus because we don't know the background level of extinction in common frog populations. But for about half the populations that experience ranovirosis, it's persistent. It carries on in the population over years, maybe not every year, but we do see ongoing mortality events. And that's what happens to frog populations in this plot when ranovirosis is persistent. The two right-hand box plots, those are populations sampled over about 10 years where we saw no evidence of ranovirosis. And there the number of frogs stayed pretty constant in these populations. The two left-hand boxes show what happens when ranovirus emerges and is persistent over the same time span. So populations of 30, 40, up to 100 frogs, they tend to lose about 83% of the population and they don't recover. It doesn't matter how big the population is, it's driven down to very low abundance and the frog populations maybe tick along with very few breeding, frog, breeding frogs and ongoing patterns of disease. Now, unlike chytridiomycosis, we're not seeing so much spillover into other hosts. The table on the left-hand side shows infection prevalence in several other species at sites where there's common frog infections and disease. 
So essentially in common toads, great crested newts, invasive alpine newts, common newts, we just don't see infections of ranavirosis. And on the right hand side, the graphs show experimental data on infection and signs of disease in common frogs and common toads. The gray bars are infection prevalence and signs of disease in common frogs, and the black bars are for common toads. And you can see whether you're looking at infection prevalence in the top graph or signs of disease in the bottom graph, common frogs are ubiquitously affected by different isolates at different concentrations, whereas common toads, for the most part, don't get infected and are unlikely to show signs of disease. So this is very different from the chytrid situation where we can see spillover into other hosts. For some reason in the UK, ranaviruses only seem to be affecting common frogs. It's very different from what we're seeing in the continent right now in Europe, where we're seeing entire amphibian communities wiped out by ranavirus. Now these are the climate change data, and I apologize, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but the reason why I've included all this information is because we combine data from the field study, we could use data from growing virus in cell culture, and we used an animal experiment to look at the effect of increasing temperature on mortality effects in common frogs. So if we start in the field data on the left-hand side, if you just look at the top plot, that's essentially the proportion of incidents that we see in, associated with ranavirosis, associated with increasing temperature. So at sites where it's cold, say around 10 degrees to 15 degrees, we don't see a lot of cases of ranavirosis. But once we get up to around 20 degrees, we see a lot more cases of ranavirosis emerging in ponds. And if you look at the graph just below that, where you see blue and brown, I want you to focus in on the brown line. The brown line shows you the severity of the outbreak and how it changes over temperature. So when there's a, a mass mortality event at 10 degrees, you're not seeing a very severe outbreak. You're seeing about 30% mortality in the population. But once you get over to about 25 degrees, you're seeing 50% or more of the frogs dying in that one event. Now, interestingly, in that plot, we also have data for sites where there's no evidence of ranavirosis. And again, we see a temperature effect associated with mortality of common frogs. So there also seems to be a direct effect of climate change on common frog survival. And that maps absolutely perfectly with Chris Redding's study that I showed you several slides back. If we flip over to the right-hand side, where I've got cell cultures listed, that's data from two different cell lines and the growth rates of the virus grown in these two different cell lines. So it doesn't matter whether we used an iguanid cell or a fish cell line. In both cases, as temperature increased, ranavirus grew faster and caused more cell death. The bottom plot, that's where we actually challenged frogs with a couple of ranavirus isolates at two different concentrations and at two different temperatures. So what you can see at the top is the line that just goes straight across. Those are, the, those are pretty much the fake exposures and also the exposure of one of the isolates at low concentration at low temperature. The purple line at the bottom, that's the other isolate where the frogs were kept at about 27 degrees. And in that situation, all the frogs died. Just above that is a blue line that's got long and small dots in it. And that one, we had about 30% mortality. That was the other isolate. And again, that was the other isolate at 27 degrees Celsius. So in the experimental studies of frogs, when things got hotter, more frogs died. So we've got this combination now where we can say in the field, we're seeing increased severity of disease. When we grow these viruses in culture, we can say it's just simply viral growth that's changing when we increase temperature. And in the experiment, we can say when we increase temperature, more frogs die. So that kind of ties the circle together experimentally, uh, field and modeling to show that as temperatures increase in the UK, we can expect more severe outbreaks of ranavirosis and probably greater distribution of the disease. Now, within this study, too, I want you to look at one plot, the bottom right-hand plot, where it says shading and severity. Now, in that particular little tidbit there, I think we've got a hint of possibly a mitigation approach. On the left-hand side of that box, you can see there's none little shading. 
And again, focus in on the brown dots. Those are the sites that are positive for infection. When you see there's very little shading at a site, you're up around that 40-50% or that 45 to 50% mortality rate. However, on the other side where there's lots of shading, there we see a decrease in severity. And we also see the same for negative sites as well. When they're shaded, fewer frogs die. I take this as possibly some hint that we can mitigate ranavirus. And that kind of goes in line with what we saw for chytrid in the Pyrenees as well. If somehow we can decrease the temperature effects, either through mitigating climate change directly by stopping global warming or by introducing things that will mimic mitigation, such as pond shading or other things that will allow things to be cool, we can then possibly see a decrease in the impacts of disease associated with climate change. Now, for the last bit, I'm going to go back to Penular. I'm probably going to skip one slide, but as I'll just I'll just remind you that Penular was the original site where we saw declines of Aledes obstetricans due to chytridia mycosis and due to climate warming. And that's the top left panel here. But there are in fact nine species of amphibians that live in Penulara. And, and there have been counts of these animals ever since Aledes is being count, enumerated up there. Other species have been counted as well. And there's all sorts of squiggly lines there that are showing population dynamics. And what we did with all these squiggly lines and values for these, for these species was we explored the impacts of chytrid versus climate change in all these different species. Lots of horrible modeling here, and I just, uh, I just want you to focus in on the thing about the linear model. And the idea about these linear trend models is we're just simply trying to show whether there was a trend in change in abundance of these animals. It's very hard to discriminate that from lines like this. Are our populations changing at all in a predictable fashion? And if they are changing, are there more or fewer of the animals? Well, these trim linear models allowed us to say whether there's been a significant change in population size over the course of the study. Up at the top, you can see the value, the p-value for Aledes obstetricans, hugely significant. That's the species that went in decline due to chytridiomycosis associated with climate change. But what you can see as you go down those p-values for the linear model is that actually a lot of the species are exhibiting trend changes over the course of the study. So our question was, what's driving these trend changes? Is it climate? Is it chytrid? Well, about the only thing that we could find that was really associated with chytridiomycosis was changes in abundance of salamandra, so, or, or fire salamanders in the area. However, that change in fire salamander abundance was also associated with temperature change. So the right, the left-hand value here, or the left-hand graph here, is showing you the change in, the difference in prevalence over time and the partial residuals from the linear regression between prevalence and temperature, ascribing a value of whether there was prevalence change associated with climate. What you can see is that essentially there is a shift of prevalence associated with climate change. And that change in prevalence is associated with increasing temperature, which is the right-hand panel of the graph. So in other words, it does seem that fire salamanders are also experiencing increased prevalence and mortality due to chytridium mycosis. And that's associated with warming as well. But obviously the effects aren't as severe as Aledes because we're not seeing salamanders being wiped out in the area. There was a third species that seemed to be attributed to chytridium mycosis, but we can't really say anything about Rana iberica because we haven't detected infection in tadpoles or metamorphs. That's not to say there isn't sort of away from breeding site effects of chytridium mycosis that we can't detect. But we think in this particular case, the model was returning a relationship that was spurious rather than real. But what there is an effect of warming, just warming on abundance of quite a few species in the area. And that's where I just want you to look at these p-values on the right-hand side for these different species and the sign beside the p-value. So every time you see a p-value that's you know, 0.05 or greater uh, or, or smaller, you can probably say there's a significant change associated with warming. And warming, we broke up into different year events. So in other words, sometimes the warming effect is year on year. Sometimes the warming effect is delayed by a couple of years. But more importantly, I want you to look at the sign values. So what the sign values is telling you whether the warming trend and the effect on abundance is positive 
versus negative. So it does seem that warming to some degree since the decline due to chytrid is positive for alites. So in other words, we, we seem to be seeing a few more tadpoles in the pond. But this value is based on post-decline alites, so it's quite meaningless. Instead, look down and look at the number of species that have negative responses to warming. So Ufocal or Epidalia calamita seems to have a negative effect. And Rana iberica, there seems to be a negative effect of warming on their presence. So they like it a little bit cooler when they breed. But overwhelmingly, every other time you see a significant p-value, the sign for that is positive. So in other words, Hyla, Ichthyosaurus alpestris, Halophallix paresi, and in some cases salamanders, and certainly marbled newts, they all like the global warming in Penulera. So I think this is the last message that I wanted to end up with, yeah, and it is, is that we focus on climate change as being a negative effect for amphibians. And certainly we, we, we know it is a negative effect for some amphibians. We also know that the effects of climate change are interacting with other things, predominantly infectious disease, certainly habitat alteration, and pesticides and pollutants as well. However, we have to be cautious in selling a ubiquitous message of climate change causing amphibians to go extinct. Because what we actually are seeing for a subset of amphibians is we're seeing them expanding into areas that they didn't previously occupy or in areas where they're existing on the margins, increasing in abundance associated with global warming. That's actually a pattern that we're seeing in Asia. That's a pattern we're seeing in some parts of Africa and certainly patterns that we're seeing in Europe. I'm not going to speak to the Americas. You all can probably speak to that better than I can. But here's the point I, I just want to leave you with. If you're going to work on climate change, first off, understand your biological mechanism through which climate change is going to interact with your species. Is it on tadpoles, juveniles, adults? Figure that out. Is it going to affect breeding, prey availability, uh, overwintering? Figure that out. The next thing is make sure you understand whether climate change is going to have a negative or positive effect because you are gonna have cases where climate change is actually gonna to be to the benefit of your species rather than the detriment to your species. And we need to not just go out there with the global negative message of climate change, because if we don't have the right message, the people that want to naysay climate change as an impact on biodiversity will grab onto our failures and our misapprehensions a lot more than they will when we get it right.